there's a charm and a charisma to Art the Clown, especially what David brings to it, that sets him apart from a lot of other uh, slashers. He's got so much personality, and, and there's so much humanity that comes through that people really gravitate toward him. <laughs> we'll see you in court. <laughs> Thank you. Have a nice day. Oh, hi, Mark. It's delicious. <laughs> oh, my God. On the surface, we're known for the gore primarily and what's going to be the next big murder set piece. But I think that it's worth seeing just to uh, check out Art the Clown and see what this character is about and why he seems to be clicking with people uh, in the horror genre and why, um, you know, just see what an incredible job David does with this character. It's very special. It's not something that comes along often. So, uh, And this one is maybe the darkest one believe it or not in the uh, franchise i wanted to go back tonally to the feel of part one because part two got very sort of fantastical and it was brighter colors a different tone and uh i just wanted to make sure we didn't go too far into that direction before it's too late and we start to lose ourselves and forget what got us here in the first place so um it's grittier it's a little more disturbing but still very fun and it has perhaps my three favorite Art the Clown moments, which are hysterical. I tell people, if you were just walking by the theater and you didn't necessarily know it was playing, you might walk by at any given time hearing the audience howling and thinking there's a comedy playing. And I think that's one of the fun things about this franchise and kind of sets it apart in one uh, instance you could be throwing up, leaving, fainting, right? Horrified, and then the next, you're laughing your butt off. So it's a, it's a, it's a good time. But it's not... It's not an obvious horror comedy, but there are moments where there are big laughs. How, as a writer, director, do you kind of balance those tones and get the kind of get that mood right? Um, do you go in kind of knowing what all those those beats are going to be beforehand, or when you see the performances, does that kind of elevate that? Yeah, it's a combination. You know, with this franchise, I never set out to make uh, a movie this funny. Because uh, growing up, and you know, I gravitated more towards straight horror movies, very dark, sinister ones. Although I love Evil Dead 2, or Return of the Living Dead. I love horror comedies. But this one, it just sort of became organic with the Art the Clown character. Uh, we just started finding that levity naturally, especially once David came on board. And I started seeing how sort of quirky and theatrical he could be. But even the more um, graphic the films got, the more I wanted to inject that levity into it. Because at the end of the day, I wanted this to be a fun experience for audiences. I didn't want them leaving these films feeling very bleak and miserable about <laughs> existence, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, no, it's... Um, I write these gags for the most part. It's all it's in the script, but then once we get to set, you know, I allow everybody to improv and play, and we're we're figuring it out and seeing if we can pull more levity out of the situation. Um, so it's it's a fun collaborative process. Amazing. Um, and as an actor, Elliot, when you um, when you saw the script for Terrify Two for the first time, and then were then invited back for Terrify Three. Um, as a, as a younger actor, when you saw the script for the first time, it must have been quite a daunting prospect, the stuff that you have to go through, stuff that your character goes through. Uh, what was your first reaction when you were kind of brought into the, the franchise? Uh, I, I've been a huge horror fan my entire life. I was a fan of the first Terrifier uh, before I even auditioned for Terrifier 2. So we, we kind of knew what we were getting into. Um, so I, it was just excitement. Like any, anything, the whole script, I remember reading it and being amazed and excited, even just as a fan of Terrifier. Awesome, that is, that is, I'm glad you weren't traumatized, so that's, that's good to know that you're actually like, no, this is gonna be fun. Um, but there must be moments when, both as an actor and as a director uh, and a writer, you think, how the hell are we actually gonna do this scene or this this moment? So were, were there moments as an actor where you thought, I'm, I'm laying in a pool of blood or I'm doing this or I'm doing that, how is this actually gonna, look in the final project so were there moments on set when you were kind of thinking okay this is you know how is this actually gonna work in the final product i honestly had a hundred percent faith in damien or whatever whatever situation i'd be in i'd be fine uh i i also didn't get it too bad like uh i didn't get as bloody i wasn't laying into any pools of, <laughs> of blood or anything but i would say the i don't know the that scene where art the clown was eating 
any of my leg when I was laying on all, all the rusty all the rusty stuff because that was like just there that wasn't like placed there it, it was a real environment but other than that I mean I, I even that I wasn't I wasn't too worried about anything another day in the office <laughs> yeah. standard cool yeah. nice um and for you Damien are there are there moments because you work with a lot of practical effects oh and, g- yeah and uh the whole the way the blood the oh. whole way how are we going to pull that off how yeah. does this happen because I write with no limitations in mind. Write as if I have a $50 million budget and then we're going to go shoot Star Wars, right? And then, then you set, reality sets in and you have to come back down from your clouds and say, all right, now we got to really figure out, is this possible? Is this too much? How are we going to pull this off? Miraculously, we pretty much pull off anything I write somehow. Uh, we figure out a way. The, the water tank in Terrifier 2 was a huge ordeal trying to figure out how to engineer that because we could not afford uh, a team to come in and build that. I mean, where do you, how do you figure out how to build something like that? We was calling aquariums uh, and, and eventually we built it. And by we, it was Phil, my producer, Phil Falcone, and uh, his, his buddy who's a childhood friend who was a, a welder. They came in and they figured out how to build this thing. So, I mean, that's re- it's really um, do it yourself on, on the first two Terrifiers, especially. Uh, Terrifier 1, the hacksaw scene that everybody talks about now. I wrote it, but then how are you actually going to do that? How much can you get away with the, uh, the actress? Can you really put Catherine in that <laughs> position? And how long can a b- person be upside down? And you, you don't think about the things like blood rushing down her body, going up her nose, and then building a fake body uh, to replicate her that you can really do nasty stuff to. So um, we always just dive in and, and, and pull, it, pull it off somehow. So we've been lucky thus far. Well, they're clearly films that are made with a lot of love for the horror genre, and, oh, sure. and you've come from a relatively small budget and a small following in terms of uh, you know, fans latching on to the, the film and the characters, and now it's become this big cult horror um, kind of extravaganza phenomenon. Uh, how do you feel going from that initial idea to now seeing people dressed as art the clown, conventions, uh, the reactions, how, how does that all feel for you? It, it's such a beautiful thing, it really is. It makes me, it's, we're, we're so grateful for it, um, especially just because my favorite part of that is that it's come from a very genuine, organic place, and I have been obsessed with these films since I'm a very little kid, four years old, three years old, you know? Uh, my mother used to let me watch these movies, take me to this mom and pop video store my entire childhood, and she'd virtually let me rent whatever I wanted, and I just fell in love with these characters, especially the slashers. Those were my, uh, those were my superheroes, so to speak, when I was a kid. Uh, and then I started going to horror conventions when I was in my early teens and meeting some of my heroes and the actors from these films. I met makeup effects artist Tom Savini, who's probably the most influential person in my life in terms of certainly with makeup effects, but even filmmaking, because that led to me being a filmmaker. So, you know, I was just this really fascinated kid with all this wonderment, so to speak. And now on the other end of that, we do a lot of horror conventions and seeing young filmmakers come up to me all the time aspiring filmmakers and you know i see like the young seven-year-old me and to me that's that's the best part if i can give something back and you know i see somebody experiencing and getting that joy that i got as a child that's the most rewarding part for me with all of this amazing and and for you kind of now being in this franchise and seeing the reaction uh to fans meeting fans talking to people about it how has the whole kind of experience of being in that world been a little similar to him, I also grew up going to horror conventions. My, uh, my parents were vendors at horror conventions, and so I would have all these opportunities to meet some of my favorites, favorite actors, uh, horror actors. So it, now it's, it's hard to wrap the, my head around it. It's, it's surreal to kind of just stop, and he's been saying the same thing recently. It's hard to just stop and appreciate everything because it's just crazy. <laughs> it's, it's just really crazy. Every horror con, all the vendors that have awesome art the clown art or all the cosplayers, like all that commitment is so cool. Tattoos. Yes, tattoos, insane. <laughs> That's so crazy to me. Have you had any have you seen any tattooed of your face yet on the, anyone? I haven't seen any John tattoos. But <laughs> I think I think Art the Clown and, and, and like the little pale girl are like the two uh, like the main ones and every time it's like some of the coolest tattoos you yeah. see too like they're all done like perfectly uh 
and I even have some tattoo artists like that are friends. Like, check this out! I just did this tattoo. Or oh, awesome. the clown. Nice. It, it's, it's really <laughs> surreal. And in terms of uh, thinking up horrible ways to mutilate and murder people, <laughs> does that ever uh, does that ever get an issue when you're like, how what, how can I possibly go further? How can I go weirder? Do you also feel an expectation yeah. to go bigger, go harder? Absolutely, yeah. Because the pressure mounts with each sequel because we have to surpass what we did previously. I keep telling people there's only so many things you can do to the human body <laughs> Legally. at this point. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and we're not just competing with ourselves. We're competing with every other horror movie out there. And you're, you know, brilliant horror movies with ingenious murder methods like Saw. And it's like... How are you gonna? How are you gonna top that? It's it's very difficult, and you never know where inspiration is gonna hit you. Um, the first terrifier, right? We, it was notorious for the hacksaw scene, and that was me purposely investigating for that particular kill medieval torture methods seeing is there anything i'd never heard of before and i saw this method of hanging people upside down cutting them in half and i thought i'd never seen that in a slasher movie let's <laughs> give that a try uh second movie i was in a bookstore and i was uh, in the true crime section flipping through a book about jack the ripper and i saw a picture of one of jack the ripper's victims and it was this poor woman horribly mutilated on a bed uh, very disturbing, and I said, uh, what if art was responsible for that? Let me reverse engineer that, and how did this person end up in that situation? Uh, part three, um, not to give spoilers, but most people see it's in the trailer. There is, a, there is a shower massacre, and this is sort of my homage to Psycho nice. and Scarface. Uh, and I said, if, you know, if Hitchcock was making Psycho now, would he shoot the same scene, or would he take a little more, you know, liberties with what he could show in uh, modern filmmaking uh, or if I was given the opportunity now to remake Psycho which they'll never give me that opportunity uh, but it's one of my favorite movies I watch it like twice a year I said how would I shoot that scene of course I would show everything so I said you know I'm gonna you know this is my opportunity to get a crack at the shower scene in Psycho so that's one of the set pieces in Terrifier 3. Well, I'm here for uh, Psycho remake without the clown. I think that would be uh, <laughs> that would be nice, or just remaking it yourself. That would be uh, totally on board with that. Um, and uh, what, what do you think it is about the films that um, horror fans have latched onto so much? Because obviously, horror is huge at the moment. Yeah. It's it's hard to stand out, um, and you know, yeah. uh, fans have really loved it. And uh, what, what do you think it is about the particular characters? I think there's been a, a void for this type of character, the 80s slasher, uh, that we all, there's a huge generation of us, we grew up, like I said, I mean, they shaped my <laughs> childhood to a degree. I mean, I am a horror filmmaker because of the impact that those characters had on me. And sort of after Ghostface, and that's a long time ago now in Scream, right, the, the, the original, uh, there hasn't really been too many that have come out and, and struck that, you know, hit that nerve. And I think art's hopefully, uh, hopefully hitting that nerve now. But I think there's just a couple of really important boxes that this character checks. Uh, you have to have a striking appearance. And most people who've discovered this character discovered it on Netflix having not known anything about the movie. They were just scrolling through and they saw his face and they said, ooh, he's interesting. I'm going to check that out and see what it's about. Uh, then you have to have really cool kill scenes if it's a slasher. Uh, I want to walk the walk. Being a makeup effects artist, I wanted to show things that maybe a Hollywood horror movie wouldn't have the, you know, the ability to show just because of the rating restrictions and things like that. So you're giving horror fans things that they don't typically see and that's fresh and that's exciting. But I think the most important thing is his, there's a charm and a charisma to Art the Clown, especially what David brings to it that sets him apart from a lot of other uh, slashers. He's got so much personality and, and there's so much humanity that comes through that people really gravitate toward. I think the more human, the more human sort of quirks and gestures they can get out of this character, the more they appreciate him and of course the humor, uh, which is why Freddy is the king of slashers, uh, in, in my opinion, because um, he's got so, he's the most three-dimensional out of all those. And I think if you can mix the horror and the levity, you have some sort of magic there. So he's kind of like the silent Freddy, in my opinion. Yeah, the, the silent movie horror. I'm not comparing him to Freddy, <laughs> Freddy Krueger, but uh, yeah, I think there's something there. No, absolutely. Um, and sales of sunglasses with uh, flowers on <laughs> yeah. have gone up 5,000%. So that's, uh, that's good. Somebody you, in China is very happy. Are you seeing any of that return? <laughs> 
No, I mean we did. Those were generic glasses from like China. I yeah, just yeah. I just ordered a box of wacky glasses. Yeah, yeah. Brought them to set. We put them on the rack, and then Dave just had a field day trying each one on. And I have just tons of footage of him messing around there. And those just I love the way he looked. I love the the contrast of the yellow to his black and white. And he just looked like a bug or an alien. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna use that one. And it's just he said it for two seconds, and now it's uh, everybody's wearing. <laughs> Um, and finally, just to, to wrap up, um, Art is a busy guy as a, as a clown. What, what do you think he does on his downtime, on his day off? What's, uh, is he a podcast guy? Is he a, is he a Sudoku man? What's, what's the, what do you think he does? I honestly wouldn't be surprised if he's watching horror movies. Okay. Know, maybe, getting tips. Yeah, yeah getting yeah. some tips, getting some inspiration, like just like Damien, maybe reading some true <laughs> crime, watching true crime. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, Probably, yeah, probably horror movies. Maybe he spins a record or two. I like to believe I'm a huge music fan. Maybe that would be pretty cool. Like, just thinking about murders, listening to some death metal or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, probably just chilling out, relaxing, right? Chilling out, doing horrendous things. I, (laughs) I say, if you see Terrifier 3, no spoilers, but you'll find out what he does in his off time for five years. (laughs) Okay, okay, cool. I'm I'm, I'm ready for that. Um, and uh, just um, just to get an insight into to you guys as as people as opposed to filmmakers um, and, and actors, was there a moment for either of you growing up or a film or a person that kind of uh, set you on the path that you're on today? Was there a, a moment where you thought that's what I want to do? Uh, I've like once again, I've always wanted to do acting ever since I I remember being a young kid going to these horror conventions, but. Uh, my my dad one day just said and he's right over there he just said hey do you want to do you want me to look into like an acting agency i'm like what is that what's an acting agency and he's like oh it's you get auditions and stuff I'm like hell yeah uh and ever since then i never looked back but some of my favorite actors that have always inspired me i mean robert de niro is always a it's a classic <laughs> um <laughs> brian cranston uh i mean phenomenal actor uh, John Carlo Esposito, I had the wonderful chance to meet him at a horror convention. Amazing. Uh, twice. And both times I'm just like, oh my God. <laughs> uh, so yeah, th- those I would say are my, 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 my big three probably. Amazing. Yeah. And for you, Dave? Uh, well, we touched upon Tom Savini is my ultimate influence because that made me want to, he made me want to become a makeup effects artist and that led to filmmaking. When I started taking filmmaking seriously, the two biggest directors who influenced me especially because i was what 12 or something around 94 95 it was tarantino who's still one of my heroes um because he changed the game when he came out there was everybody wanted to be a filmmaker um and then and really maybe right before i became obsessed with tarantino it was scorsese who's still my other hero because that was one of the first filmmakers where i noticed uh, a signature style and you can see his techniques that he would use over and over that nobody else was using. And it's almost as if he was starring in his own films through the camera. Yeah. And I thought, ooh, the, the, yeah, the, the filmmaker can really put his stamp on, on, on his films and uh, a style that's <laughs> notably his. And I thought that was, really, that was really cool. So it was those two, for sure. And Spielberg. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Well, guys, congratulations on the film. I'm very excited to see it tonight and a pleasure to meet you both. Thank you for talking to me. And oh, uh, thank you best so of luck with the, the tour of the film. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thanks very much. Cheers.